Hello, everybody. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Andrew Chitty. I am the Interim Challenge Director for Audience of the Future. Um, so, so welcome to the uh, BFI South Bank. It's a, it's a, it's nice to see so many people here. I can't imagine which what it was about the 60 million pounds of funding that brought you all here this afternoon. Um, just to take through, so this 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 is the plan. Obviously, all timings are, are off a little bit, but um, but that's okay, I think. Uh, so I'm going to just set the competition, the demonstrated competition for audience of the future, uh, in a bit of context. It's launched today. You could even you could be you could be filling in draft application forms as we speak. Um, so I'll do a scene setter, do a bit of uh, Q and A on that, um, and then we'll do some some presentations around. One of the things, one of the, the core feature of this competition is we want people to move on the state of the art, creatively, uh, technologically, commercially. So we just have a few things to get us uh, thinking about what the state of the art is and, and, and how uh, immersive, uh, what new experiences are enabled by um, immersive technologies and moving image. Bit of a panel discussion, then we'll have a bit of a tea and coffee break, and then we'll have a kind of networking. So it's a slightly structured networking, and we've now done this twice on our travels, once with all the theatre people, or performance people, so it's theatre, music, opera, and then once with all the museums people. And it's worked both of those two times, so I'm really hoping it's going to be equally successful with you guys, and we'll obviously draw conclusions if it's not. Um, and then we'll do just close by saying some next steps uh, of what, how the timeline for this works out and how you can pursue ideas that you might be developing. So, um, audience of the future um, context. So, so, so the overall context is, and it's a kind of important to realise this because it's, it's it's quite different from other forms of funding. So different from, from say BFI funding, which we'll hear about. Um, different from uh, Arts Council funding, R&D, different from Research Councils, even slightly different from Innovate. So it has its origins in the industrial strategy. So the, the, the UK government's decision that in a <coughs> post-Brexit world, um, we need to support our key industrial sectors. Uh, and that the way that everyone can agree that they should be supported is a large amount of the money in the industrial strategy is to support research and development. Um, so, so when the, f the first um, first projects funded out of the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund, uh, hopefully that's the last time I'll say that, uh, came out about a year ago, they were initially they were automotive sector. Uh, it's now called the Faraday Institute. So this is uh, an intervention uh, around um, the development of new battery technologies, which will underlie. Uh, future of vehicle production. Um, there was uh, one of the initial announcements was also about remotely piloted uh, uh, and autonomous vehicles in dangerous situations. So that's an intervention in R&D to support the oil and gas sector, primarily. And uh, then there have been both in the first wave and in the second wave, indeed, uh, several interventions in, in within the life sciences. So pharma, um, healthcare, healthy aging, all those kind of things. So these are the kind of very traditional. Uh, research intensive, R&D intensive, sex of the economy. Um, you know, and in, in any application, in any in any kind of kind of funding queue for these things, the medics, the automotive industry, and the engineers are very well organised and right at the front of the queue. Um, there wasn't anything initially uh, to support the creative industries, and one of the one of the things we found out from uh, from from this exercise. Uh, was that though everybody in policy circles thinks the creative industries are a jolly good thing and that they are an enormously important industrial sector, um, actually as big as the pre three previous sectors put together economically, the idea that you should support innovation in the same way and research and development in the same way as you do in those sectors, that's, that was not an argument that any of us have won. So 15, 20 years of creative industries policy, creative industry is good, yep, they've got that bit, but funding innovation um, in uh, the creative industries, not so much one. So we've changed that. We've now got two projects, of which this is the second. So, so the first, and some of you may have been involved in this, uh, we will be announcing late summer eight uh, creative research and development partnerships. So these are university and industry working together on creative clusters across the UK. Um, so that's 50 odd million pounds worth of funding going into R&D. 
but through partnerships between ind universities and industry. In many ways, what we're talking about today is the, is, is the other way around. It's funding direct to industry. So clusters was a big element of Peter Bazalgette's report on the creative industries, and that really helped gather momentum for that first round of funding. And Peter was also very helpful in pointing out, with a little bit of help from the team that are supporting this challenge, that in terms of innovation challenges, one of the biggest, and perhaps the, the biggest across the creative industries for technology innovation was the impact that immersive technologies could have on what we do, how we make things, and what we make, and what our audiences are. And um, actually, Baz was enormously helpful in pointing out that this wasn't that intervening in this area wasn't about intervening in technology, but was about intervening to support the new forms of experience. And particularly, as we're talking about moving image today, particularly the challenges that the moving image sector has in transiting to what Alex McDowell, who's a good friend of this program, um, production designer and minority report, so, describes as the spherical world. So uh, there are a lot of new skills and new techniques that we need to develop. Um, and so Baz's intervention really helped us get this across the line so that we ended up with £33 million uh, of funding announced in the Industrial Strategy White Paper in the autumn. So that's all, that's, that's all the good stuff. Um, so we got £33 million across the programme. The, they talked about us challenges, so we've had to create a challenge statement. So it's just a statement of what is the problem that we're trying to solve. Uh, and so this is the audience of the future challenge statement. And it, it, it's, it, 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 it's interesting in a particular way. So capturing new global audiences and growing our leading market position in creative content products and services by adopting, exploiting, and developing immersive technologies. So the formulation there is quite important. It's about the experiences enabled by the technology, not about the technology. Now, I think through the work that, that, that Baz has done and we've done elaborating this, I think that's really quite important. So this is, I can now say, because since it launched this morning, they can't stop it. This is investment in content R&D, not in technology R&D. It's our belief that innovation in content pulls through technology and develops new technology that we need in the creative sector, but that this is an investment in how the UK earns its money through the creative industries, which is we sell tickets, we sell royalties, we, we create IP, we put bums on seats, we sell subscriptions. It's the experience that sells those to the audiences. So, so the rationale was that um, so immersive technologies, we'll go and talk about what we think of as immersive technologies. They're the p most potentially disruptive and, and significant um, technological change since the web in the mid-90s. And So I set up a web business in the mid-90s, a mid-late 90s coming out of television, and actually the field at the moment feels to me very much like that, in that skills and knowledge are distributed unevenly across the place. Uh, there are specialist companies trying to make, uh, make, a, make a business out of just doing this stuff. There are large areas of the, of the sector that don't know much about it at all. Um, who will win what the right formulations are, we don't know, but we've got um, a considerable build in talent, just like it was 20 years ago. Um, the thing about this technology is, at the moment, uh, you know, moving image, uh, obviously, the, the, you know, we always quote stats, thanks to the Creative Industries Council, we've kind of like drilled us into them uh, in our heads, uh, a little bit like the Manchurian candidate, that half of all television formats in the world are created in the UK, 20% of last year's global box office was UK qualifying films, and I know that that's a very specialist subject, what the UK qualifying film is, but the assumption that that will translate into using these new technologies is just an assumption. This is a great opportunity, we could become brilliant at this, but it also could be a threat. The hardware and platform operators are not UK companies. If we don't respond to this and support uh, creative development in this area, then those hardware and software platform ecosystems could go elsewhere for their content. So um, as I've said, the other assumption rationale is that the opportunity for the creative industries is in that content, uh, not in the platform or hardware, which seems obvious to you guys if you're talking to people who are very interested in R&D in the Department of Business or whatever it's called this week, um, then that doesn't seem obvious to them. Um, we've got some objectives we're supposed to meet. 2025, we're a global market leader in the creative immersive sector. Now, some people might say we already are, but it's a very small sector at the moment, and it's going to be over those years. It's going to grow very rapidly. Uh, and the UK creates 10% of global creative immersive content. Again, that doesn't seem unreasonable, 
but it just might not happen. Um, you know, as I say, that's half of the status of the, uh, of the film industry at the moment, but that's taken years and a whole battery of interventions to achieve. So uh, this competition, this, this funding is quite central, centrally featured in the uh, creative industry sector deal, mainly because it's new money and there's precious little of that around. So um, when, we, when the sector deal was being put together, the expectations on what we're doing is, is one of the large expectations for, from uh, industry is that we'll de-risk investment. So at the moment, uh, there's, we all probably know what a 50 grand, 200 grand, maybe even a bit more than that immersive project looks like, but do we really, are, are major media companies investing in this at scale? Well, it's hard to do that if you haven't got uh, a commercial model underneath it and it's hard to build a commercial model if you haven't got an audience proposition uh, that's, that's, that's scalable. So one of the things that the expectations here is to identify and test viable audience propositions and in the search for the new business and commercial models underlying. Um, other bits of the competition, which I'll briefly outline in a minute, are, are innovations around production tools, making things faster, more efficient, uh, and, and on uh, developing the workforce skills. Um, and we think to do this, we're going to need industry engagement across the value chain. So this is not just funding for those creative specialist immersive companies, although we expect them to play a significant role and we expect this uh, whole competition to develop them and provide support for them, but we need everybody else to make this work. So content studios, IP owners, hardware providers, platforms, uh, we want to bring the investment community along and expose them to what everybody's doing and whatever will form the distribution chain uh, in this medium. So. Um, We've got 33 million of grant funding. Um, so we're doing three, we're dividing that up into three main programs. 16 million demonstrator program, which is what we can talk about today. 12 million R&D, and five million for the industry center of excellence. Now, actually, normally I downplay that bit, but for this audience, the industry center of excellence is specifically only talking about the screen industries. So games, film, television, digital media content, um, this is strictly uh, devoted to that. It's not right across the creative industries. So the demonstrator program, I'll keep saying this, and hopefully everyone will believe me by the end, uh, what we're looking for is very, very ambitious pro projects um, that take this pre-commercial state, uh, state of the sector at the moment uh, and do innovative content using glo losing globally recognized IP. Um, so they're new experiences to test things at scale, and we expect them to be large collaborations so that they can not just impact a couple of businesses, but across the, the whole sector. CRD, we're going to do a couple of things. Uh, we're launching a design competition. So this is, if demonstrators is stupidly big, um, the design competition is meant to be just a concept formation stage. So that goes live today as well. Um, we're going to look at a CRD program in the autumn around um, making content cheaper, faster, more accessible. And then we're going to do an investment accelerator at the back end of the year, try working with a number of VCs to bring in using matching public money, amplifying it with private money to invest in single companies uh, and their pipelines. Um, and the, as I said, the industry center of excellence is about talent development and then experimental production for the screen industries. And that's where it crosses over with the, uh, with the other project. But what we're talking about today is the demonstrators. Um, 33 million pounds, this is good, no, okay, quick quick bit of public accounting. 33 million pounds of their money equals 56 million pounds in program because of all the brilliant match funding that you're all going to bring to it. Yeah, okay, uh, that will become obvious, uh, I, I think, later. Uh, the thing about this is not just the requirement for match funding, uh, which anybody who's done an Innovate program knows is, 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 is we're not being ludicrously ambitious, um, but the short time scale. So we've only got three financial years to do this because of the government, the comprehensive spending review. Uh, we have to get all this money in the old phase out of the door uh, by the end of the 2021 financial year. Uh, and that's not long, because that's three years and the first year's already started. So hence why everything's very compressed about this, this application process. Um, <coughs> we need to get these quite big, ambitious, and risky projects up and running very quickly. Um, so, demonstrators, rationale for that, uh, so it's the same, same themes. Immersive economy is based on strength in content, nine technology. 
uh, investment currently held back by the lack of at-scale audience propositions that could then un underpin uh, commercial models. Um, much of the work is currently small scale, and therefore uh, the argument runs, as we ran it with the young people at the Treasury, um, that this justifies a public in investment in a series of large-scale demonstrators, content demonstrators, um, that provide sectoral learning uh, and generate data for audience insight and business modeling at scale. Right, so what have we got? Uh, well, we've got 16 million quid. Um, so the maximum grant for any project is four million pounds. That doesn't mean the maximum size of any project is four million pounds. They could be as big as you like. But the maximum amount any consortium can bid for in grant funding is four million. And we've identified four areas as areas of maximum opportunity. So performance, we ran an event like this with uh, the, the, the performance companies I said at Stratford um, earlier, no, last week now. Uh, moving image, sports entertainment, and visitor experience. And what we're looking for is projects that can significantly advance the creative, technological, and commercial state of the art across each of these sectors. So it's not just about funding a project. It's got a wider ambition than that. So what do we mean? Um, well, we're quite expansive, or inclusive, I suppose is the word, in what we think of as, as immersive experiences. So in the sports field, there's been there was a lot of interest generated early on in the, in the industrial centers around Formula One. Um, you know, UK, large parts of the Formula One industry are in the UK. Obviously, they've got a new rights holder who is not in the UK. Um, but you can imagine creating, or that industry can imagine creating in the sports entertainment world, an additional immersive experience for their global audience uh, of, of race, racing. Uh, or other sports, well, this is, this is a piece of work done by Rewind with Microsoft HoloLens. You'll see the visors. So this would be kind of a, an in-home augmented reality or mixed reality experience. And this was done for uh, some work done around the Red Bull uh, air race. Now, that's, that's kind of concept stuff. Um, probably one of the pieces that you could point to and, and say was a seminal piece of work that did move the state of the art on, certainly in, uh, in theatre and performance, was, was um, this piece, which is the Raw Shakespeare's company's Tempest, which I don't know, did anybody see? So this had, yeah, good, you're very cultured man, John. Um, they, so the, this was, uh, Ariel was generated, Ariel was sometimes a live actor, sometimes the actor left the stage, donned a mocap uh, suit, and then was projected back in graphic form. So you've got this fantastical character. And the great thing, I think, about this was not only the work that Intel and Imaginarium and lots of other people did around creating the piece, the best thing about it was it was a great production of The Tempest. So Simon Russell Beale as Prospero, and the impact was of an integrated production. So it's really set the bar in terms, of, in terms of what people can do. But there are other people working in the space, I think, who are using m m multi multiple technologies. So this is 59 Productions play, the Howard Brenton play about the making of the Spitfire in Southampton during the war, um, where you use multiple sets of technologies within, an, uh, within a theatre environment to create a more immersive experience. So nothing, no headsets, uh, no AR visors, but, but, but technologies used in a mixture of ways to make things more immersive. In the visitor experience uh, environment, obviously one of the things we're looking at is, is how can people augment uh, a whole space? How can they annotate, add a data layer to a museum or gallery, either through mobile AR or, or through other means, or to augment uh, an entire um, an entire geography? So I think one of the things I'm not sure if I put it on the slides, but if one of these big demonstrator projects doesn't make the case for augmented or mixed reality at scale, we will have failed. So this is not just about what we can see now; it's about making things work at scale. Uh, I'm sure I not the only person in the room who has done the AR project with a, with a museum on a mobile phone. I think if one of us has done it, I think 40 of us have done it. The problem is, at small scale, it just doesn't work. It just doesn't tell you anything. So we need to take these things to scale. Um, other people are obviously uh, are developing things in, a different, uh, uh, in, in different ways. This is uh, BDH, uh, who are sitting down the front. Um, marvelous piece of VR done with the Magritte Estate beautiful piece of headset VR, but one of the most interesting things is then trying to create the kinds of environment in which you consume these, and obviously the way forward is massive hats. 
So we'll be expecting lots of proposals in from massive hats. Um, in film, it's obviously, I think, I think film and TV, you've got a real, um, there's a real kind of state of the art both in what it contributes to production, these technologies, and what it contributes to consumption. And one of the things we'll maybe pick up on the panel is how these two things come together. So there's lots of technology innovation in films, both in graphics, special effects and in production. So things like gravity, because um, this is the compulsory anti-circus slide. Everyone has to have one. Um, and uh, mocap has obviously become a key technology. But now we're seeing previs, we're seeing designers work uh, with immersive environments and create worlds which you then tell the story in. Um, again, in the, in, in the visitor experience space, this, uh, this is uh, Factory 42's brilliant piece of work, Hold the World. Um, so this is, most, this is uh, volumetrically capturing a national treasure in, in David Attenborough, and then, um, and then a one-on-one -on -one encounter. So this isn't in the museum. It doesn't recreate the museum. It's kind of behind the scenes, but it's a thing all of its own. It's a, it's a new form of content. Um, Again, we're pretty expansive. Some, I fully expect someone to try and argue that actually, the most uh, in performance, the most immersive form of performance is theatre. Thank you very much. We've got everything we want. Um, but I think that there are other ways of creating immersive experiences by augmentation than putting stuff on screens. It's a very old picture of a secret cinema uh, experience. So the idea that the best way of augmenting um, screen-based media is by employing loads of actors and creating an experience around it uh, is a very interesting one, but how do you make it scale beyond a single venue? Uh, and then we've got, uh, I hope everybody in the room has tried The Void. Oh, you're in for a treat. So it's got about three, two months to run at Westfield. So The Void is a walkthrough VR helmet and rucksack based experience where you enter the Star Wars universe. So you are in a mini story in Star Wars and you're playing with other people. So you can go four people at a time, you put your helmet on, you are a stormtrooper, so are they. So go with your kids, because it's hilarious, because you've got tiny stormtroopers with massive guns. Um, but you walk through the experience, it's definitely part of the Star Wars universe, so from the moment that you put your visor down, you understand where you are and what you're doing. So that's a commercial reality now. It's a very commercial reality if you buy four tickets. Um, but we're also interested in, in experiences that don't exist. So uh, Alex McDowell, he's a very good friend to this program, one of our advisors. Um, production designer on Minority Report, runs the World Building Institute in uh, at USC Film School. And um, this was a 50 foot whale that he flew through the audience of uh, at CES 18 months ago on a piece of work with Intel. Obviously, the whale doesn't really exist, but the audience could see it through their devices. And it's a very interesting piece of film if you watch how they react to it. So, our, our idea of what these experiences are and what the technologies involved are is inclusive rather than it's VR, it's AR, and it's haptics, although it's all of those things. Um, so, what we're trying to do, we want you to come with proposals that demonstrate innovation, obviously. Um, so, new audience experiences. We want you to generate insight. And we want you to do that by reaching an audience at scale. So there's only so much we can learn from tiny audiences, uh, and, and we, we won't learn how to make any money out of it. Um, so we want you to propose experiences that will reach a an audience in excess of 100,000. Now, we can probably talk about what we mean by audiences, but you can't just say, there's 100,000 people out there have seen this thing. Uh, so we would expect to generate in insight means, in many cases, data. And we want you to come with proposals that can both build the capacity and share knowledge across the sector. Obviously, there's a kind of interesting intersection between that and, uh, and uh, commercially sensitive information. But we want you to, we want people to come with a plan of how they're going to do that. Could just be the breadth of their consortium um, to their satisfaction. So. What do we mean? Uh, so significantly advance the state of the art is creative state of the art, new, new experiences, moving beyond what we've got now, audience proposition, so the form, commercial proposition, and the technical implementation. So that may mean new technology innovation, may mean lots of it, but it's all in the service of the audience proposition. So reach 100,000 users across the lifetime of the project. So some people may think they're going to do something and then five minutes to midnight, they're going to release it in some way, 
and gain their 100,000 audience. That might be quite a risky way to do it. Uh, that might be a way that when these proposals are assessed, we might go, that's very risky, um, but not in a good way. Um, so you might want to have more than one test along the way, that would seem. And in fact, within consortia, you might want to test more than one thing. Um, but we do want you to gather audience data. And there's a reason that we've asked people to work with globally recognized IP. And again, we have a very Catholic definition of globally recognized IP. So Tate might be a globally recognized IP in the Vista experience business. So it's not just about characters or, um, or, or prop known properties. It's about cultural brands. And, uh, but what we want, the reason we've asked to do that is because the failure of a lot of the attempts to do this in the past has been um, not to solve the problem of audience acquisition. So we've had technology demonstrators that have then had 10 people using them, and that's no bloody use to anybody. So if you have work with globally recognized IP, it has two advantages. One is it has presence and familiarity in the market, so it allows you to test the new stuff, but it also allows you to track the audience. Um, it also means that although this is R&D money, it means we're talking about tackling rights and IP issues and how they work in this medium uh, from the start, and therefore the commercial models. Um, so this was a uh, Jeremy Bounds and uh, a comment on this program to my colleagues at the Catapult, um, and, and and caused a little bit of a wobble a couple of weeks ago. Um, that every one of the each one of these demonstrators, each one of the four, would be the biggest creative VR project in the world at the moment. I have no idea whether it's true, but it's quite it's kind of quite scary, um, and that's deliberate. We deliberately have decided to go for to try and fund projects that are themselves large and risky. Um, but a few comments on it. It's very ambitious, but it's not just a VR project. If we, if, if, if we, we, this is not how we see it. This is not about the current experience of VR. This is about what comes next. So we're looking for game changers. So just things that we won't be funding. We won't be funding the next thing you were planning, but a bit bigger. Because uh, it's, it's hard to get hold of this money, and that would be dull. Uh, we won't be proposing the same thing we've seen before, but a lot bigger. Um, and I think it's important that people, therefore, know what the state of the art is. Um, and we won't be funding things that aren't core to the future, don't seem central to the future of the sector. So they've got very narrow applicability. Um, we do recognize, however, that um, the scale of the funding we're talking about, as I say, lots of people are comfortable working into the hundreds of thousands. Uh, but it, for many people, this is beyond their current experience, but not for everyone. So it's only, as we try to explain again to the people in the Treasury, this is a very small budget if it's a film or a piece of TV. There are, there are plenty of people in this sector who know how to spend this kind of money wisely. The question is, do they know how to spend this money wisely on this stuff? So we do recognize that you need to have a think in your scope, in how you do your production, in the scale of the experience, in the talent that you might use, that this is that this is a move up in scale, and that's very important then in terms of putting together uh, a consortium. Uh, we do need to spend it wisely, however. So we've been trying to think about what would be the signs that people actually didn't need this amount of money, and the one example that we came up with was if we saw large payments to rights owners in it, then we'd think that that means they didn't really need all of the money, because we're expecting with rights owners to be involved in these consortia, but if but to get enough, to be getting enough out of it, to not to be paid to take part, as it were. So if it's not central enough to their, the future of their business, for them to act as collaborators and participants, then probably the consortium's put together a bit wrong. So consortia, you could have all of those people. You could have bits of them. Uh, you could have the different uh, uh, different components. Many of you will have collaborators. So certainly some of the creative, uh, specialist creative. Immersive companies will have kind of networks of people that they work with in, in GFX or uh, uh, photogrammetry and all those kind of things. Uh, but we do think you will need everything from IP owners to hardware partners in this. Um, and as I said before, in a consortium, we expect it to have a vision how they impact the sector, not just deliver a project for a single institution or a single company. Bit on definitions, immersive experiences. So, again, I'm, I'm still trying to train. We, we find it difficult on the team to always remember to say immersive experience, not immersive technologies. But what we're interested in is the experience enabled by some or a mixture or all of these technologies. 
So what do we want out of moving image, these demonstrators? So first of all, um, what do we think a moving image, what do we think moving image is? Well, again, we're, pre we're trying to be inclusive here, so repeatable, so not fire and forget, not, not just uh, you know, situation-based pieces, but repeatable audiovisual experiences currently created for display on screens or by the people who make things for screens. So t it includes TV films, games, animation, online media, but it includes, that's not an exhaustive list. Um, they could be narrative, interactive, or game-based experiences, so I think, or they could be a mixture of all of these. So I think there are particular challenges around uh, narrative and, and, and narrative dramas. I think there are particular challenges and particular skills around game-based experience. There are particular issues around factual. But we're not saying that any one of these. And they could be adapted from source material in other media. So we don't expect this to be entirely original production. So somewhere between this definition and the need to work with um, globally recognized IP, we think there's a kind of uh, a very wide sweet spot to hit. Um, so we're particularly looking for immersive experiences that use moving image to create new audience propositions with mass market and commercial potential. That is why we're doing this. This is how we've convinced the Treasury to give us the money, is that there is a, we're looking for not things that themselves necessarily have a commercial return in the demonstrator, but that point the way for the participants and the wider sector to commercial returns. Who can bid? Uh, so to lead one of these, um, you've got to be a UK-based registered business. Now that could be the UK, a UK registered business, uh, which is part of a wider uh, global group. But you have to be; it has to be led by the UK registered business. You have to carry out project work in the UK and have an aim to exploit the results from the UK. Um, that's pretty full of holes, I think that, that that one. But that's that's the intention. We're not trying to make this a kind of little Britain kind of project. It has to be a collaboration. Collaborations have to include at least one SME. So they have to include two people, um, is, is the assumption. Um, if you're going to lead one of these, given the ludicrously short time scale that I'm about to tell you, um, you can only lead one. We just think it's not possible for you to take on the responsibilities of leading one of these bids, putting together a consortium, doing all the things you have to do in the nine and a half weeks that we're going to give you. Um, you can be a partner in two more of them. But if you're not going to lead, and there are lots of businesses in the value chain here, in the supply chain, that you'll need to put these things together. If you're not leading, you can join any number of bids. This is where it gets for those who, who, who's, who has had Innovate funding before? Anybody? OK, so that's great that some people have. Uh, and it's also something that we need to know, and that's really important to us, is there are lots of people in the room who haven't. Um, so this means we're already going into new territory. Um, so maximum of four million in grant across the whole consortium. So you do need to bring significant match funding of that. So um, we've got we're going, there's a worked example that we've worked up online, um, which, which we on our on the both the Immerse UK and the Creative Economy Program website from Friday, but. It works out that if you claim the maximum amount, you'll need to your total project costs will have to exceed five million. There is technically there is one that you can do, which is four point nine. But let's assume if you're claiming the maximum grant, you will have to raise a million pounds in match funding. Um, but we expect there to be projects bidding in here that are far in excess of that, sig that bring significant elements of, uh, of of both commercial and in kind funding. Um, if you are, uh, wherever you are in the consortium, how much of the costs you get refunded or funded by the project depends what kind of business you are. So if you're an SME, you get 70% of your costs. If you're a medium-sized business, 60. If you're a large business, 50. And that's all state aid rules. There's no way that that can uh, uh, vary. If you've got research organisations in your consortium, so you might need universities, you might need uh, uh, independent research organisations, research technology organisations, there's a whole list of them, but those kind of researchers are refunded 100% of their costs. And to any universities in the room, I saw Marion early on, 80% FEC, I'll pretend I know what that means, I kind of do, but ask an academic near you um, how that works. Um, 
the key there is total of the four million pounds of grant only 30 percent of it in total can go to research organizations and again that's that that is one of the few rules of the competition um, I think this is less relevant for this for the, for this area than say visitor experience but public sector organizations and charities are, are treated as if they're research organizations um, but with some uh, close invigilation of the costs to check that they're not double counting public money so um, the timeline is um, tight because uh, these are big they're risky um, we want things that haven't been done before We've got although We've only got two and a half years effectively to spend the money. We are thinking about things that will be the future in two and a half years, not the, 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 the current um, state of the art. So the application deadlines, the competition opened today, uh, and the applications have to be in 1st of August at noon. And for the people who have submitted for Innovate UK funding before, they know that that does mean noon. Five, I had a colleague once in my own business who submitted a two million pound grant application at two minutes past 12 one day wasted six months work um, so it's a hard deadline we're going to try and so we're going to well we're not going to try we are going to assess them over August we'll select a number to come to interview first of September uh, interview in the second week of September uh, and tell you within 14 days and then you start because we're very well aware of the backstop problem here so we want people to get we want to make these decisions as quickly as possible which given the interesting um, there's an ambition across the industrial strategy to engage the general public. It's quite hard to do that with quantum computing. But um, as in fact some of our comms colleagues are probably here in the audience, but with this stuff we really are going to engage the, the public. So there's a lot of attention actually around these projects because they're one of the best ways of communicating the industrial strategy. So. Um, we're going to have to get the, right to the top of UKRI, we'll probably ministers, and right back down again within two weeks. Um, but we know we want you to start on the 1st of November. Uh, and then you've got to complete by the 31st of December 2020, um, which is three months before the money turns, uh, turns into a pumpkin because of the comprehensive spending review, and we can't spend any more after that. Um, good stuff. If you all come up with brilliant ideas, get them spun up really quickly, and... Um, and, uh, and they all work fantastically well, despite being incredibly risky and ambitious. You never know, we might get some more money. Um, that's it for me for an introduction. So that's audits of the future, the demonstrators, and what we're kind of hoping for around a moving image demonstrator. And now I think I've got some time for questions before I shut up and we hear from some other people. Who would like to lead off with questions? What, f what an extraordinary audience. Knowing some of you, I'm finding this slightly unbelievable. Uh, oh, hi, yes. Alexandra from 360 Effects. Um, when you mean global IP recognized IP owner, um, like if we look at the networking list today, there is like five people that are in this category and three companies from the UK. First of all, can they be uh, global? So when you mean global, like can they be international, not UK IP owners? And secondly, do they really have to be globally known, or can they be known in their own country outside? Um, okay, so there's several different questions in there, I think. So can the IP be owned ex UK? Yes, it can. Um, and certainly when we're talking about audiences and the whole of this, the idea is not to have, you know, the audience can also be international that you're trying to reach and measure. Um, there are there will be issues around um, funding ex UK uh, partners, but I think that, that that what you're suggesting doesn't rule that out. I think it's up to you. I mean, we could we tried a lot, and then we just ran out of time to come up with a better definition than globally recognised. <coughs> um, I think what we wanted was to uh, place it very central that these are IP that have a position in the market. Um, as you say, they're not the easiest of people to attract into a briefing around R&D funding, but we assume that a lot of you are engaged with those kind of people. So I think the field's pretty wide. I think if we were to have an ex-UK IP that was only known in, in a specific territory, then it would be up to you to prove that that was a significant, very significant territory and how you would reach the audience in that territory and how you would also create collaboration between other 
UK businesses to come together to do that. But I don't think it's ruled out. Yeah, sorry, Dan. Let's, sorry, let's go there and then pass the mic over to there. Hi, thank you. I'm Simon Foscari from the Open University. I was wondering, with respect to the experience we've got from the Creative Industry Program, which is the uh, kind of uh, commitment you need from the prospective partners, and uh, how many sort of outlined partners we can have that are not strictly committed as yet, but maybe match fund in a later future? Thank you. Okay, so I think this is so. This is a good question, uh, and. So we're giving you a very small, short amount of time to put together a complex proposition. Um, I don't think, I think we're going to have to be pretty harsh on it in terms of commitment. Um, but I would expect that we would have pre-contract awards that would extend a little way to finalise agreements. So one of the things that you're going to think about is your collaboration agreements, and certainly with larger IP owners, when you're in open competition, it's harder to get that kind of attention than when you're in the position of, OK, they're minded us to award this. Now can we actually confirm all the arrangements and the match something? But I think it's going to have to be pretty tight. I think uh, it's, you know, we, pro we can't get into a position where we launch some of these programs that have got very ambitious match funding um, commitments and we find out 18 months down the line they haven't materialised. So I think there'll be a, um, a period of scrutiny um, to allow you to firm up commitments, but we do it. We do expect substantially that what you put forward in your um, in your proposals, although they may not, may not be utterly agreed at that moment, they'll be agreed pretty much. Uh, I would think that you know before Christmas. Yeah, down the. Oh, sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry. You've got the mic. Hi. Yeah. Hello. Yes, Mike Phillips. Um, I'm from uh, Renfrew Group. We're uh, designers and technology developers. Um, just wondering how, um, in your vision of um, the next big step, you might be limiting, or we might be limiting ourselves, by excluding any sort of hardware development? I don't think we are excluding any hardware development. Um, I think the time scales against us in some aspects with hardware development. I think, you know, we all know that there are a series of hardware rollouts that will happen over the next 18 months which will have some impact on the sector. I think specific hardware developments that enable specific types of friction and specialist things, I think they could be funded through this program, but the objective is to deliver an experience and test it. If you need to develop some specific hardware to do that, then absolutely. <coughs> oh, sorry. It, oh. Hello, Nicolas Galan from Alter Records. Um, how you, because of such a you know tight schedule, how, did you have, do you have a plan about like we say small very specialized SME with an expertise in something like for instance photogrammetry, and uh, that can that probably won't be the the company leading a project, but perfect I would say SME partners uh, to I would say to to be inserted in, into the right project to get the best, I would say, the best team for each cluster? I Absolutely. Um, so we kind of have a plan. Uh, first of all, we, we recognize it's, a, it, it's an issue. Um, I don't think around these areas, that's projects at this scale, I don't think everybody knows everybody they need, yeah. necessarily. Um, so that was the idea of having sector-wide things, and we'll try and get you to meet as many people in the room and then as, as possible here today. Um, we're working with Immerse UK, so their new platform allows you to put up a profile um, so that you can, with respect to this competition, you can advertise, promote, we have these kind of skills, we're looking for these kind of partners. And I think certainly for the first half of the competition period, we'll be trying to offer a service to match make, to put people into those environments, because I think, as I say, I don't think everybody knows everybody, and leads don't necessarily know all all of the all of the pieces they need. So yeah, we're very keen to do that. Okay, thank you. Let's work backwards. So fourth row back. Hi there, uh, James Bradley from Projection Artworks. Um, you mentioned uh, the ambition to generate new new IP within each um, consortium. Um, is there a framework within the competition to deal with the generation of new IP, or is that a, a contractual problem for the members of each su successful consortium 
to work out amongst themselves. Yeah, interesting. I didn't. I didn't mention it quite. Quite. Um, but you're absolutely right in what you say. So there is no compulsory framework uh, or compulsory uh, partnership agreement that we are going to impose on any of these consortia. It's. Uh, I think it's only. This is only. This stuff only works coming from. I'm a, I'm a convert. I'm used to be a, a run production company. Um, this is only going to work if you can sort those issues out for yourselves, because only you know the unique um, structure that you have in the consortium. I mean, I'd love to see you know IP IP rest, rest with the people who created. That's that I'd start from there. But we're not going to impose any rules. We will expect you pre-contract award to have a partnership agreement. So it's not that we don't care. We know you need one, and you know we know you need to have thought all this through, and we'll expect you have you to have an agreement by the time you start receiving money. We do need you to outline what your approach is in the proposal. So how you think you're going to sort it out. And just to prove you have thought it out, because otherwise <coughs> everybody falls out on day one, that's not really a good good result. Um, I don't know where the mic is, so should we go? Paul and then the gentleman in front. Um, Paul Gerhardt, BFI. Andrew, um, you talk a lot about the, the, the scalability of these projects, but I'm, I'm just wondering whether you expect the budget to also cover some of the critical issues around sustainability, around conservation, around retrieval, archiving, you know, all the things that are meaningful in terms of breakthroughs, in terms of cultural and heritage projects. It's a really good question, Paul. Um, I think it is a problem in this medium, uh, or in this, you know, the, the, the history of this medium, that there are always pieces of work that I wish I'd seen, but I can't now experience in any way. And it's a bit like the Sex Pistols gig at Manchester. There always seems to be more people who saw them than could possibly have done so, and you feel you miss out. Um, so we, I think we do need to think about that. Um, there's, there's an interesting conversation, I mean, we're trying to put this together at such speed, with the BSI. About, uh, about what we might be able to do. And I think, again, it's an interesting conversation with, with yourselves at the BFI of how we could ensure that, um, that there is a, um, that we take into account how we, how, we, how we archive this material so that we can, people can, can view it in the future. Uh, one of the things we're doing in the, in, in the program uh, is the, um, we're asking the digital catapult to run a support program for the four successful demonstrators, um, which some of its components will include learning across the demonstrators, sharing of different challenges and different technical solutions, um, sharing of audience measurements so that everybody will have want to measure their own audience. They might want to, there's commercial aspects to that as well, but so that we can, can make meaningful comparisons. So that's that's one of the things I think that the, the Catapult, the BFI, the BSI, we could all get together and, and think about that. Is it going to be the main budgetary thing in the proposal? I, I, I think probably it's not, but we're going. everybody needs to think about how they're going to sustain that. And perhaps that can become a piece of work that we do uh, with the catapult to, uh, as, the, as the project spin up. Um, thanks for this. It's tremendously bold and exciting. Um, Reckless. <laughs> Bold. Um, the uh, w when we make movies, for instance, we set up special purpose vehicles, which effectively create the intellectual property or sort of exploit the IP that we're actually putting in there. And we may license IP from other medium. Um, I envision, I guess, doing a similar type of deal here, where effectively all the different partners are, some of them may be co-applicants, but some also will be a startup. Does it matter that that startup or special purpose vehicle is the lead applicant, or does it need to be a running business? I think, um, so that's, that, that, I think, is a unique question that we haven't had before. Um, and I'll probably have to go back to you. I think that our financial validity checks um, about the lead, uh, the lead applicant in terms of its ability to take on a project of this scale. So there are some requirements there. Um, I'll go back to the competition scene because, particularly in this sector, obviously the SPV route is um, <coughs> is is a known one. I, I think I think I'd wonder why set up an SPV for this because uh, the objective is to move the is 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 pre-commercial collaboration. 
often a solution is within the within the uh, um, partnership agreements to maybe set up or set up an SPV that can that can hold resultant IP. But I think um, I'll, I'll go back and find out, and we'll release out the answer on the technical question: Is can a can a non previously non trading SPV be a lead in it? But I think I'd, I'd also encourage you to think about why in what's a highly risky R&D project having an SPV as a lead rather than as something you might put things into is the right way. Hi, uh, Marion Russo from University of York. Uh, not about uh, uh, the academic partners, but uh, about IP again. Um, we have uh, We have been approached by a company that has a UK branch but the mother company is in Germany. And I'm not sure how we can protect the IP to, to remain and, and be kind of intended to be used in, in the UK on your third bullet point on the IP. Um, it doesn't have to remain in the UK. The idea was to exploit it from the UK. So that's the, that's the comment. So I, I, are, they, uh, are they a branch or are they a UK? Do they have a UK operating company? Then I think I mean we can take it on again. We'll go as as people's ideas develop. I think we'll do some. One of the things we'll do is do some webinars around some technical aspects of this that'll emerge because it, this is quite different from 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 other innovate competitions, uh, particularly around creative IP. So um, if they're a if they're a UK if they've got a UK opco, then that's the first step, uh, and then it's a question of where the work is done and. And, and where the audience data is, and then where the IP is held. We've got one down the front. Right. Andrew, hi. It's um, John from Factory 42. Hello, John. Hi. I was just going to ask a bit about audience acquisition and yep. in terms of the costs of that yep. and your kind of view on can they, how much of them, can any of them fit in the budget? What's your sort of sense? Because clearly you can make an amazing experience, but you've got to let people know it exists. Yeah. What's, what's your sense on that, please? Um, well, I think I think it was to kind of it was it was to kind of get around some of these things that we thought about the idea of you working with IP. I mean, obviously you, you, yourselves, you work with Natural History Museum, you work with you know you work with Sky. These are these are big, big brands, and, and Attenborough himself, you could say, is a is a globally recognised IP. Um, I guess it boils down to: Are you saying can you include marketing costs within the budget? <coughs> There are specific exclusions around marketing costs uh, in terms of using the grant money to do that. But I think the partners that you bring in, perhaps some of the most valuable things people can bring in is, is, is marketing channels. Um, I think on audiences as well, um, the, the, the idea, uh, uh, some of your partners can bring in whether it's locations or other channels, they can bring routes to an audience, I think. And one of the things that perhaps hasn't come up and is, is slightly related is people ask, can they charge for some of these experiences? And to which, to, to which this is an interesting one to go back to the research council type model with, they go, what? That's amazing. And you go, how are you going to test commercial models if you don't do, don't, if you don't do some pricing models in there as well? So I think if there's, if there's specific things that you think might not be eligible, or that I think that you think might prove a challenge if they're not part of the budget, I think you, then probably as, as ideas develop, bring them, bring us to them, and then we'll, you know, we'll come, we'll, we'll find the right answer, and then we'll share it with everybody unattributably, because I think that's the, that's the only kind of fair way to do it. Are we, are we've got yes, one in the centre there, and then. Okay. Yep. Hi, I'm freelance producer director Mitch Turnbull. Um, will the weighting of a publicly funded IP owner, um, i.e., wholly publicly funded versus, versus partially fu public funded um, IP owner, affect the selection decision? Sorry, I have to clarify. So, do you, what, what, what? So, if the, if the IP owner is a publicly funded organisation, um, how? So, so, our main criteria will be the quality of the proposition. Um, 
It depends what kind of publicly funded. So there will be there will be financial consequences potentially, uh, and how in how the application is put together and the and the way the money is received. If the IPN is is UK publicly funded, um, it might be easier. If could could you risk um, illustrating it with an example? BBC versus the Tate. Um, I, I mean, I think they'd be on a level playing field with anybody else. Um, I think. Are you worried that they'd be um, beneficially? It won't be one of our criteria. Yeah. So, so, the, so the lead has to be a business. So there are bits of Tate that are a business, for instance. There are bits of Tate that are not. Uh, if they match it, so they're also an IRO. So they're a really complicated beast. So how they put themselves together and whether they, whether they would say to lead would have consequences for how much funding that they would be able to gather from it. Obviously, there is, as I think was on one of the bullet points, there's an absolute division between the use of other sources of public funding. Um, so any public institution ha it has to, uh, has a much higher threshold in terms of proving that they are not cross subsidizing using their public funding does that help the bbc it's a complicated one i would say always okay i think that's probably um it, that's probably uh, as many questions as we can go through